Joining me now to tell us more about Hassan Rouhani and what his victory means for Iran and the United States are Kareem Sajadpour, a senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and Cliff Kupchin, Middle East director at the Eurasia, Eurasia Group. Cliff Kupchin, you've met him. What is he? Who is he? Tell us about him. Well, he's a very straightforward, thoughtful, uh, earnest guy. You ask a question, you get an answer. He, he's, he's, he's kind of the anti Ahmadinejad. You ask a question, you get a tirade. So, so I, I think it's a it's a new leaf for Iran. I think we're out of the ideology and we're back into the to, to the realm of the real world. Now, how much power he has and how far he can take Iran in the new world, it's a different question. Well, I'm curious about this Kareem Sajidpour because he's uniformly been described as a moderate, which means what by our standards. Well, it's all relative. If we were having this conversation 10 years ago, Rouhani would have been described as a conservative. But given the rightward shift of Iranian politics over the last decade, he was really the lone uh, moderate choice that people had in this election. And if you look at Iran over the last decade, this is a nation which has been suffocating under political pressure, economic mismanagement, and tremendous external economic pressure. So I think for the Iranian people, this is the meteorological equivalent of a light rain after eight years of drought. But if you were to draw some sort of loop between Ahmadinejad on one side and Khatami on the other, is he in the middle somewhere? He is in the middle somewhere. <clears throat> but I think. He's not a reformer. No, and that's what's very important for everyone to understand. He is not a reformer, he is a child of the system. He served as the secretary of the National Security Council for 16 years. He sits on Iran's highest adjudicating bodies. He is very, very close to the supreme leader. So he is a cautious man of the system who may pursue reform, but is not going to turn his back on the system. And that's why, I think, in my view, Supreme Leader Khamenei let him become president, because ultimately, Khamenei does not view him as a threat to the system. If the supreme leader is the guy who gets the final say, how much power does Rouhani really have? Well, Iranian presidents have influence domestically, I would argue, more than they do internationally in changing the strategic principles of the Islamic Republic. So just like in Washington, when there's a new president, you bring in a whole new team, a group of folks to staff the bureaucracies. And Rouhani will be able to bring more kind of professional managers and technocrats into the system, those types of moderate forces that have been purged over the last decade. But when it comes to, I would argue, the ideological principles of the Iranian regime in the Islamic Revolution, resistance against America, uh, rejection of Israel's existence, uh, support for groups like Hezbollah, for the Assad regime in Syria, I would argue that Rouhani's influence is going to be more tactical than strategic. He's not going to be able to change those principles, but he can, do so, he can, he can conduct diplomacy with a smiling, moderate face, as opposed to Ahmadinejad. What about nuclear weapons? We have been watching Iran's nuclear capability grow. That's what, obviously, Israel is worried about. It's what almost everybody t is worried about, tangentially or directly. Right. Well, look, I mean, I, I, I agree with my friend Kareem that, that, that we're unlikely to see change on Syria. But I think the nuclear arena is different. This is where, well, in the debates, Gwen, he effectively linked Iran's nuclear position with sanctions, with the suffering of every Iranian citizen, and it worked. So in some ways, this election was a mandate for, Has for Hassan Rouhani to pursue a different nuclear policy. I think that he will pursue a more reasonable position. I think he will bring in skilled diplomats, and the atmospherics will change. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to get a deal. But it means I think we got a better chance today than we did last Friday. When you say we, does that mean the U.S. finally has someone to deal with, to talk to, who's not going to come to the well of the U.N. and declare the U.S. Uh, <laughs> smells of sulfur or whatever uh -huh. that was? Well, first, I agree with Cliff's perspective that this, for the Obama administration, was the best possible outcome or the least bad outcome of a very flawed electoral process. And I think if, you know, you talk to someone like Secretary of State John Kerry, uh, Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel, even Obama himself, they could push a button and normalize relations with Iran they would love to because Iran has significant influence over a lot of U.S. foreign policy challenges. But I would argue this time around, as opposed to Obama's first term, um, they're, they're, what, what they're hoping for is less a rapprochement, which they probably see as unrealistic, and more detente. But I would argue that the person who is perhaps most concerned with Hassan Rouhani's victory is Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu of Israel. 
uh, because I think what, what he sees is a, the equivalent of putting lipstick on a pig. Iran is going to continue to pursue, he believes, the same hardline nuclear policies, but do so with a moderate face, which is going to make it more difficult to coerce and pressure Iran. Is that what he should be worried about, Cliff Copton? I think the Israelis get, get the reception. I, I, I think they know that at the end of the day that Iran will have some domestic ability to enrich uranium, that the world is, whether they recognize Iran's right to enrich, they will recognize that Iran is enriching. And what Netanyahu is up to is to keep the pressure on to get the best deal, to get the most inspections, to get the longest lead time if they do try to create a weapon so that something can be done about it. So I, I think he's worried. I think he'll keep the pressure up. But if we can get a good, verifiable, intrusive deal, and I've been to Israel six times in the last two years, and that's what they tell you. They, they would support that. They'll go So along these conversations, these talks that were underway and then were frozen and waiting on the outcome of the selection, we expect them to start again? I think they will start again. The, uh, Rouhani will be inaugurated in August. And if you look at his previous team of nuclear advisors, they were all U.S. educated. They came from merchant backgrounds. They weren't ideologues. So I think he has a mandate, at least from the Iranian public, to pursue a process of confidence building. You have a government in Washington that is interested in confidence building. This is the first time that these stars have aligned since uh, the year 2000. But I think, you know, our expectations should be tempered. Final brief question for both of you. In your opinion, I'll start with you, Kareem. Was this a free and fair election? We saw the turnout. It wasn't um, free in that uh, only a limited pool of candidates were allowed to run. Um, but as opposed to the 2009 election, when and people believed the votes weren't counted, this time it looked, uh, to the surprise of many of us, that the integrity of the ballot box was respected. Cliff? It wasn't free in the same way that Kareem said, but, but compare Iran to its neighbors, where there aren't any elections. There is still, I would point out, this remarkable, enduring, democratic streak in Iran, and the Iranians really do care about the vote. It's a remarkable country. I think it was free and fair enough for me to admire what happened. Cliff Kupchin of the Eurasia Group and Kareem Sajadpour of the Carnegie Endowment. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Thank Glenn. You, Glenn.